Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to At Bristol and our third annual Festival of Economics as part of the Bristol Festival Ideas. My name is Andrew Kelly from the festival. Just before we start the events, um, I just wanted to say thank you to all the people who have supported this festival, our partners, Arts Council England, Bristol City Council and Business West, our supporters, the Economic and Social Research Council, Government Economic Service, Princeton University Press, Joseph Rowntree Foundation, the Royal Economic Society, Philip Allen Publishers, the University of Bristol, the uh, West of England Local Enterprise Partnership, the Economics Network and the Centre um, for Management and Public Organisations at the University of Bristol. We're very grateful for all their support. Without them, we wouldn't be able to put these events on. Um, so um, we do appreciate what they do for us. Um, we've um, delighted with the turnout and the ticket sales for this, so thank you very much. And we'll start uh, in a moment. But one further thank you, which is that this festival, we normally program the festival events ourselves. This festival is programmed by Diane Coyle. And without her, we wouldn't simply be able to do this festival. So as well as joining with me in welcoming Isabella Kaminska, who's going to be chairing this first session and introducing John Lanchester, if you'll join with me in thanking our speakers, the sponsors, and Diane Coyle, I'd be very much grateful. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm Isabella Kaminska. I'm from the Financial Times. Um, I work on the FT Alphaville blog, where I spend a, a large part of my day trying to understand what all these banking types um, are really saying. And most of the time, I feel really stupid asking very basic questions. So when I got asked to read this this book, I was really excited, mainly because it made me feel like I wasn't necessarily the only person out there asking stupid questions. <laughs> um, so John, why don't you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to write the book if, and, and the core premise of the book? Um, it started, I, 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 I was, wanted to write a novel about London because uh, I was very interested in the scale and extent of the change in, in London. Um, so I, I grew up in Hong Kong, and when I first sort of travelled through London in the 70s, it struck me as, as quite a sort of drab and provincial place, and very, very grey. Um, you know, the, the buildings were grey, the sky was grey, the people were grey, um, the food was grey. <laughs> The food was incredibly grey. Um, and, and, you know, no one could think that now. It's unmistakably a place of immense energy and vibrancy and diversity and, and with a sort of edge to it. Um, I remember the first time I went to New York in about 1981, thinking that there was this sort of edge almost of... It's like a caffeinated edge that was almost an edge of menace. And now when I go back to London, I, I feel that. You know, there's a sort of abrasive, urgent quality to it that didn't used to be there. So I got very interested in that thing about just the scale of the change and started thinking about what the drivers of that change had been. And it seemed to me that a crucial one was, was finance and economics, that if you're looking at the modern UK, actually, you have to look at the city of London as an incredibly important part of it. And I sort of realised how little I knew. And uh, that was really where it started. I realised that, um, you know, I'd got to, got to the age I was and, and actually was completely ignorant, of, I mean, embarrassingly, awfully, humiliatingly ignorant of just all kinds of basics um, about economics, which actually turned out to be basics about how the world worked. And, and that, was the, that was the starting point. So why, why do you think you had that sort of uh, knowledge gap? In, I mean, and what, do you think you, were, you represent the bulk of the population in, that, in having that kind of knowledge gap? or I think I did a bit. I think it's, I think it's a kind of quite a common thing that you're sort of allowed to be... You're allowed to, to not know, and in a way that, you know, no one would kind of proudly announce being clueless about any aspect of science. You can proudly announce being clueless about any aspect of economics and money. I know, and I know, because, because people often do. Um, and in, fa in fact, funny enough, I was very struck about, you know, when you think about things you've changed in the world, about the only thing I can claim to have changed was I wrote a piece in The Guardian about quizzes never having an economic component. And so in a particularly singled out university challenge, it was used to be very striking, and now, blow me down, they do. They always have <laughs> one. And nobody ever gets it. Yeah. So... Part of the problem, uh, you know, 
borrowing on my own experience, I think is that banking and finance comes across as extremely boring, sterile, <coughs> jargon heavy, and these terms are just very alienating. You're, you spend a lot of the book sort of theorizing about why it is these bankers choose very purposefully to use these alienating terms. Well, tell me a little bit about what you think is going on there. And, and my, my first book was about a, a psychopathic foodie snob, uh, an incredibly obnoxious person who also turns out to be a serial murderer, kills nine, and ten, nine, nine or ten people he kills off. And the question I was most often asked was, is it autobiographical? <laughs> And, you know, to this day, I haven't got the answer straight. But, and, and with this one, the thing that keeps coming up, so I talk about jargon the way you have, and the, the question that people answered is, is it, do, they do, it, do they do it on purpose? It keeps coming around to that. And, and the truthful answer, I th or what I think I think about that, is that actually it doesn't really matter. You know, the question of intent is sort of insoluble. And, and the, the main thing is, is the is the consequence, you know, from the point of view of the, the person listening, the excluded party, the party on the outside, the party overhearing it. If someone is talking about you know, super synthetic CDS is made of synthetic CDOs based on RMBS, which, by the way, was a real thing in the credit crunch, doesn't matter if that person is deliberately trying to bamboozle you or, or not. I mean, the, the net effect is, is that you're kind of structurally excluded, and you just can't take part in the conversation. Now, those, are, you know, those sim super synthetic CDSs and CDOs are very complicated, and it's quite helpful for people who deal in them to have the, have the jargon. Um, but at the same time, there is a kind of structural process of exclusion. Right, so it's a sort of unwitting club, because... We, I, don't, I mean, you probably know more than I do, because I mean, when we were talking before about that, you think there quite often is an element of intent and... Yeah, I, I think it's sort of, it, in, it depends which industry um, you look at, uh, but I definitely have come across uh, purposeful kind of, this word that I never can pronounce, obfuscation, yeah. um, especially when it comes to derivatives and uh, anything to do with shadow banking or regulatory arbitrage. These are all these fantastically exciting terms that basically mean not doing what the, break, you know, what the authorities want you to do. Um, but... Um, I think it's also partly unwitting, and it's about creating a club, and and it's shorthand at the end of the day because these are, it's shorthand that makes you want to think these are complex ideas that need shorthand. But what I found very interesting, I think your book really shows this very well, is that most of the time, the illusion is complexity, but in reality, when you open the box, the basics are the same everywhere. There's only a few fundamental things that humans are really capable of doing. I mean, it's behavioral. We, we just can't do more than a few actions. So it's very hard for, um, it's, it's very hard to be too complicated. Um, and, you know, you, you make a, in the book, you open up with the analogy of Jack Nicholson. Um, I thought that was a really good, you, you'll be familiar with the, with a few good men in which like Jack Nicholson is like uh, having a bit of a rant because he's been exposed as doing something bad and it's all because you can't handle the truth and us poor people are on the outside and we don't you know it's almost like um, you don't want to know and we'll keep it we'll keep it in the club because it's just too complicated for you but really we know it's not. Do you think that's... Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there is a sense, particularly in the political class, <coughs> that, that, that if, we're t if they're too candid about the economic realities, that it's effectively a sense that, you know, we can't handle the truth, we don't actually want to know um, the, you know, the realities of the economic position. And I think there is an element of, you know... Well, I mean, when, having said that intent doesn't matter, I, d I think there's sometimes things where you can kind of catch it. And I, one of the things that stands out for me is quantitative easing. And the thing about that is it is a really suspiciously neutral... A, it's suspiciously neutral. I always think it sounds like a brand of laxative. Yeah, it's trying to, you know. <laughs> what, do you think about, what do you think about quantitative easing? I don't know. My nan said just stick to a bowl of prunes. Yeah. Um, and, it, and, and it certainly doesn't tell you what it is, which is a radical experimental new technique for governments to print money without admitting that that's what they're doing. And you, you, when you see things at the kind of central bank level, I was very struck with Mario, Mario Draghi who runs the ECB, European Central Bank. You can't even say who he is without using jargon. 
Um, and he's talking about the ECB announcing a program of ECB not doing full QE. Instead, they were doing a program of ABS, buying asset-backed securities. Uh, and, and then he kept saying, with detailed modalities to follow. He said it so often, it was like a mantra. It's like one of those Buddhist things where you can feel yourself starting to levitate. And you get detailed modalities, detailed modalities. And you know, the thing about saying detailed modalities as a follow, what he actually means is, we'll tell you later how we're going to do it. That's what that means in English. We'll tell you, you know, how we're going to do it. And, and, the, and the thing is there, though, if he actually says, oh, we'll tell you later how we're going to do it, somebody's going to stick their hand up and say, oh, Mario, sorry. Um, the thing is, when you say, we'll tell you later how we're going to do it, it sounds a bit like you don't actually know. <laughs> And funnily enough, I have a suspicion that most of the time they don't. Yeah. Um, I mean, you talk in the book about just generally using uh, the, the industry, using euphemisms whenever it can. And the kind of san sanitizing, this kind of has a sanitizing role. So it distances you from the reality of what's really going on. It removes you. But the more you use substitutes that are very clinical, like quantitative easing and all that sort of stuff, the more it distances you from the actual nuts and bolts of what's going on. And, um, and you also make a point about how fundamentally banking is a kind of rentier system. It's, it's a kind of, it doesn't really add all that much real economy value. Therefore, what's going on here is just that we're trying to, dis is it that, do you think it's that we're trying to disguise the fact that there are these bankers who work in an information economy and they don't want to really expose the fact that they don't add that much value. I think that's part of it. I mean, there's always been an element of imposture in banking mm -hmm. and some of it's necessary. My, my father worked for a bank back in the old days, uh, the, the then sleepy colonial institution, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. Uh, at that point, when my dad worked there, it was the 200th biggest bank in Asia and it's now the second biggest bank in the world uh, as global mega giant HSBC. And, and in those days, um, you know, the kind of social utility of the, to that type of banking, you could see, because it was to do with, um, you know, person A lending money to person B because person B needs it and person A has excess capital. That, you don't need complicated fancy language to explain that. It's, it's what in the old days used to be called the 363 model, where you take deposits at 3%, you lend them at 6%, and you're on the golf course by 3 o'clock. <laughs> and al although it's easy to ridicule that as sort of Captain Mannering land, you know, that banking we can all understand the utility of, but when it's people betting against each other with exotic financial instruments and derivatives, for instance, you know, you're an investment bank, I'm an investment bank, we, we take other sides of a position, one of us wins, one of us loses. The only real social utility to that is, is if you pay your taxes, which A, you probably don't, because you do clever things with it, and B, I'm going to declare the loss, so I'm not going to be paying my taxes. So the social utility is effectively nothing, Whereas we, we, the taxpayer, are carrying the risks. If the banks blow up and need a bailout, you know, guess who it is who writes the check? So you, you would try and you know, uh, obfuscate that as much as you can, and you would throw as much of a veil over it as you possibly could. I mean, I think the other, the other use of language inside the business is a thing I hadn't thought about, actually, until someone came up to me after a, a talk in New York, and he said, that, um, he said there was something that I hadn't thought about, happen, which is to do with the effect of um, dissociation, that helping people who make these decisions switch off. And he, he works in a leveraged buyout, which is basically, it's like with Manchester United, it's like using Manchester United to take itself over by borrowing money against it. That was a classic leveraged buyout. And he, and he said he and his colleagues were looking at some paperwork and they were going through the numbers. And they were talking about the churn, which was the turnover of of costs associated with particular customers. And they were looking, they'd been looking at these numbers for about an hour, and then he suddenly sort of had one of those moments where you kind of snap out of it and think about what he was actually doing. And because the business whose numbers they were looking at was a residential care home, and the churn was people dying. <laughs> and, and he said that actually, you know, the language is very important at that thing of just sort of having some of your, some of your thoughts and feelings just turn to off. So yeah, there's this sanitizing, it sanitizes the reality. And that reminds me a lot of what we've seen maybe in the language of war as well. You know, how shell shock has become post-traumatic you know, syndrome or whatever. I don't even know yeah. the correct term nowadays. So it goes from something very understandable, you know what shell shock is, but you don't really know. 
I mean, it becomes cl more clinical. Yeah. I mean, you make a point. You you bring up a in that capacity. You, you, one of your um, you unpack the term right sizing, which I thought was a great one in terms of what does it mean? Yeah, we're sacking people, but lots of things. <laughs> Would you <laughs> right sizing? But there's a funny thing. <laughs> a, 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 Americans perceive our preferred term for it is incredibly shocking. They have all these euphemisms, but uh, in American English, redundancy is incredibly shocking because it's basically like going up to say, someone and saying, by the way, we love you, but you're a totally worthless human being. You're redundant. You have no use or function. Uh, and so lots of them are, are kind of bizarre and jolting, downsourcing, outsizing. As you say, right-sizing has something particularly terrible about it. <laughs> there is a right size for this organisation. It just doesn't include you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I still think like one of the most... I learned about banking, really, um, and I, I think the one thing that really made me understand it more than anything else is, um, and I have Walt Disney to thank for this, is Mary Poppins. Mm. Um, because it, that's, that tells the story, doesn't it? I have a banker friend who recommends it, actually, and whose who's children, as they've got older, as they've got to the right age, he makes them read Mary Poppins so they understand what daddy does. You know, it strikes as quite a sort of... A striking way of doing it. I've forgotten, what, I've forgotten what it is that brings the bank down. Oh, it, he, he wants to feed the birds rather right. than uh, invest in the bank and in railways in China and well, railways in wherever. It was. There's some <laughs> there's some bubble type thing that he doesn't want to invest in. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. And then there's a run on the bank, and he yeah. it turns out he yeah. was right all along. Yeah, exactly. And then Miss, Mr. Banks has to quit. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, you know, you can learn about all the about the fundamentals of banking basically from you know bit of Mary Poppins and, and then there's a, a very good Arthur Haley novel. Arthur Haley novel. Arthur Haley, who I think is now largely unread, but he wrote these, he did one business at a time. He did one about hotels uh, and he did one about a cruise liner. He did one about airplanes and they used to be made into these big budget, rather schlocky films. And there's always a huge cast and there's always some disaster or scare or scandal. Uh, and he did a banking one that's actually really, really informative. And there's a bank run in it. I remember... Um, Finding out, you know, that was the first time I ever heard of what a bank run bank run was. Um, you know, it came in quite handy when Northern Rock imploded. Yeah, and we and, and then let's not forget the classic, A Wonderful Life, that really does, yeah. does pin it down. Um, but going back to the terms, let's look at some of the actual terms because some of them. When I started writing um, about finance, I was at Reuters. I, I was a graduate trainee, and you get sort of thrust into the. Um, you know, into the thick of it without much training. That's how they, they just make you go for it and you immediately have to call all these very obnoxious traders and they start tell, using all these phrases that you just have no idea what, what they are. And um, I'll never forget um, the two terms that really confused me at that time was people talking about things being bullish and bearish. I was like, what? what, what, what? <laughs> um, you mentioned these terms in the book. Where, I mean, what? Why? I've Why tried, bear? Why I've tried bull? looking into bullish and bearish, um, and nobody seems to... I mean, nobody knows, that's the truth. But, but one of the best theories is that it's to do with the horns that go up. Uh -huh. a, bull, a bull market is when you think things are going up. Uh -huh. and, and bears, when they attack, they go like that. So it goes down. <laughs> goes downwards. But, you know, nobody really knows. The odd thing, though, is that um, if you... Because I have farmers in my family in, in Ireland, and bulls are terrifying things. Yeah. Bulls are scary, unpredictable, and have a sort of natural aggression and violence in them. So it's sort of a bit ironic, really, that they turned into, hey, it's bullish. Have you ever done, like, an archive search for that to see where it N the, originates from? It, no, I mean, it comes... Um, it's American in the first instance. Yeah. Um, and uh, Merrill Lynch famously have a bull as their as their symbol, but you, you can't find in the etymology, you can't find, you know, where, it, as it were, you can't find the origin of it. It's sort of not, it doesn't explain itself. Another one that has always struck me as, we just use it as second nature uh, when we talk about central banks. And when you really think about it, you're like, well, why do we use these terms? It's the terms dovish and hawkish. Yeah. Um, this is something I'm particularly interested in because I've actually been uh, looking into the etymology mm. of it and it looks like I can't trace it before 1966. Oh, so enough. it's really recent. It's only yeah. 40 years old. Yeah. And it seems to be linked to the Vietnam War oh. and um, game theory. So its first use is military and then it crosses over to... Because now it's almost exclusively used in relation to interest rates and inflation, isn't it? It's sort of pinned down specifically. It was a term of war whether you're in favour of... 
um, fighting in Vietnam or not. And now it's basically to do with whether you think inf inflation is a risk or doesn't matter. Um, yeah, exactly. That's a strange journey for the word to have gone on. But they do go on these very odd journeys. You know, the one, one of the things that got me... Um, I was very interested in, that in, the, in the way I talk about it in the book is reversification, things turning yes. into their apparent opposites, mm -hmm. and these words going on the journey. And one of the ones that really struck me, was, was particularly interesting, was hedge fund, because I kept being asked what a hedge fund is. Because you know, we all know what a hedge is. Oh, look, there's a hedge. Um, and the, but a hedge fund is a um, largely deregulated pool of private capital operating via a partnership structure using large amounts of leverage and borrowed money and usually proprietary mathematical techniques. You know, what? <laughs> okay, we a hedge, but, you know, and how did it turn into that? And, and, and in fact, what it is, is a process of continual innovation. And it's as if the sort of innovation has pressed the language into a new shape. And I think there's quite a lot of that in finance, that the sort of the forces, if you like, the forces almost of capitalism, you know, bending words out of shape. And what I find very interesting is um, I've, I was doing a little informal uh, study <laughs> of, um, just to try and figure out if the bankers themselves know what these terms, you know, where they originate from, or have they just taken them on and without second thought. And in my survey, I was, I was specifically asking about Dovish and Hawkish, and mm. so far, no one I've spoken to, and I've spoken to at least 10, 15 people in banking, know the origin. So are you surprised by that? No, nobody cares. Nobody I mean, cares. Because, I mean, it's one of the interesting things about the condition of the modern business is that nobody has much interest in history. And it's quite a striking thing in economics, too, that economics really doesn't give much role to history, um, you know, because the models are more important than the and the things you learn, you know, the history is, isn't really a kind of a serious area of study. And that seems to me a quite a fundamental weakness uh, in, the, in the field of economics, the, the kind of attempt to override, you know, broad historical lessons and kind of replace them essentially with um, uh, quasi-mathematical models. I mean, there was a classic just, just the other day um, reported in the FT. I'm amazed this didn't get more attention. Um, have people here heard of the flash crash? It was in 2010. It was this, this sudden, bizarre, massive um, crash in American share prices uh, that recovered all the value within about two seconds. And, and the thing that was strange about it was that nobody understood the cause. And it's been much, much studied. And it's thought that it was to do with high-frequency trading. But no one to this day really knows. Um, and the, the thing that happened in um, uh, October the 15th, just, just over a month ago, um, is, in the, is in the U.S. government bond market, which is the biggest market in the world, because um, U.S. government debt is absolutely rock solid. It's massively traded. Prices hardly move in, in, in a sharp way because you have basically someone willing to buy and someone willing to sell all the time just at very slightly different prices. So on October the 15th, the 10-year U.S. government debt goes from 1. I think it's 2.3% about down to about 1.8% in... in a fraction of a second. Now, that might not sound like a big deal, but in the, the move is so abrupt. In the language of math, mathematics, it's what's called a seven sigma deviation. And that means... It's very, very rare. That means that <laughs> it, it should only be possible, you should only encounter it once every 1.6 billion years. <laughs> so, what the, and in, in effect, what that math is telling you is that it's totally... Totally, totally impossible. It just can't happen. Nobody plans for segment, seven sigma events. They just don't feature in anyone's. So what that means is that the models are just flatly wrong. Something massive happened, and nobody has a single clue what it was. And they just had the FT was reporting on the conference to study it. And this conference of professionals engaged in the thing had, as, it, as the paper very politely said, a very wide range of views about the actual <laughs> causes. And that's a completely terrifying thing that's essentially based on the maths having got out of hand. That means the maths has got completely out of hand, it's taken its over, it's broken, and nobody knows how or why, and nobody knows how to fix it. This raises another good point, which is in the book you talk about the fact that the layperson who isn't an expert in finance or economics kind of like it trusts that the people who do are in charge of all this know what they're doing and that there is a sort of standard theory. But as you point out very eloquently, it turns out nobody agrees with anybody, actually. Yeah. And there isn't a standard. We're all like, 
walking through the dark. <laughs> and I think, you know, I think several things about that. Firstly, I think people do trust it much less. I think that's one of the things that's changed very fundamentally since 2008. I think there was a sense that um, uh, it was, it's, there's that old Peanuts cartoon, Charlie Brown and Lucy, talking about you know, the feeling you have when your parents are in the front of the car and you feel safe and comfortable and everything's being looked after and you know where you're going. And then one day comes and you know, actually you're in the front of the car, to which Lucy turns and says, hold me, Chuck. You know, and the thing is, we used to think there was someone in the front of the car, and we, now we know they're not. I think that kind of confidence has, has largely gone. Um, and uh, you, you know, the other thing is that the, the scale of the, the, the sheer speed and size and interconnectedness of finance has got to the point where you, you, you can't have adult supervision. You know, it's not possible for someone to, as it were, have control of it and to have a full sense of how it works. You know, the idea that these markets are um, orderly and manageable is just a, is a comforting fantasy. But it's one that's very much propagated to the public, I think, no? Yeah, and it's one of, but it's one of the things where there's a big, big gap between, you know, I notice a, a, a striking gap between how worried the insiders are in private and the way it all seems in public. You know, to go back to the thing my dad used to say, you say, you know, the reason banks look so imposing and so sort of, you know, intimidating, you're, you're supposed to be on your best behaviour in this huge, you know, marble and granite and, uh, you know, this air of, you know, we're here forever, don't worry, is because they're inherently very fragile, very risky institutions. Which is a bit like how propaganda cults work as well. Nice big pictures of Lenin, <laughs> you know, we're imposing, we're here for the long term. Yeah. You can't bust us. <laughs> no, exactly. And, you know, because in fact, you know, their margins are wafer thin. Precisely. Um, so one of the terms that you, you, you uh, unpack is my, one of my personal favourites and one that is banned at the FT. We're not allowed to use it. And it's HNWI. Oh. Would you care to explain? High net worth individual. Uh, <laughs> and it means, uh, it means you've got more than a, a million dollars in non-property assets. So you've got a million dollars in financial things and things you can invest and play around with. And the, the financial services industry likes it because that means you've got money to invest and for them to charge fees on. From our perspective, um, there's always, you know, there are, it, I imagine most newspapers have the same sort of um, pol policing authorities when it comes to what, what terms you can and cannot use. Um, we're always taught you, you just have to say rich. It's the rich. <laughs> Unpack it to, to the point. Um, but what I find is really interesting with that term is that I just see it feed, feedback into all my quotes because people just love using it in the industry. Is there, do they say Hunwi or something? I mean, <laughs> I don't there, know, but it's you, like you talk to H people on the phone, like right. hedge funds and right. stuff, and, and they'll be like, oh, you know, high net worth. So it creeps back into the copy because they're just desperately putting it into quotes and you know it's it's just they can't help themselves <laughs> they love to use you that you have to just have to do a search and replace remove hnwi and replace with bridge yes exactly and then there's <laughs> uhnwi which is ultra high net worth individual which is 30 million isn't it and these parameters are changing all the time yeah and, uh, and they change up i mean it's, i got very interested in it when i was writing capital because um which is the novel I ended up doing and, and at an early stage i was thinking about having a properly very rich character in it. Um, as, I mean, there's a banker in it who wants to get a million pound bonus, and spoiler alert, he doesn't. Um, uh, but I was, I was, you know, some, as it were, oligarch rich type figure. Um, but as I sort of researched it more, and I got interested in the ultra high net worth stuff, and also in something else that's in the book, it's called the Forbes Cost of Living Extremely Well Index, <laughs> which is the things that incredibly rich people spend their money on, which is very, very, in a dark way, it's very funny. It's things like yacht hire, um, uh, a jet. year's tuition at Harvard, private jets, fur coats, Rolexes, all that. Um, uh, and an hour's psychoana psychoanalysis on the Upper East Side. That was one of the categories. <laughs> and they, and, it tra and it's, they Forbes publish it every year, and it measures inflation for the mega-rich. Um, so I got interested in it and researched it, and I realised that you, I couldn't put that character in the novel, because the novel is all about how people's lives overlap with each other. And the, the UHNWIs... Their lives don't. That's mainly what they use the money for, is for a kind of insulation, that they, they very precisely don't want to be in the world among us and occupying the same sorts of spaces. 
Um, so that's my, my interest in that field ca came from the book, but actually I couldn't... I mean, in a way that I thought was actually humanly quite interesting, that person would, didn't belong in a novel with, as it were, normal people. It just couldn't be squeezed in. I mean, it's interesting because this, this is fundamentally a book about terminologies, but you do focus on the... I mean, you, you definitely get the impression that you have a message here about inequality and what, what is your, your particular take on it. I mean, the thing about inequality is that you can have, as it were, a right-wing version of it, which is, you know, Wayne Rooney's better at football than I am, apparently. Um, so, you know, he's a gazillionaire and I'm not, and that's fine. You know, that's, it, as it were, benign inequality, um, that the more talented do better. The thing that um, is, I think, the real challenge to that, it's a real challenge across, where, whatever your politics are, is that it's increasingly obvious that societies with high levels of inequality have high levels of heritability as well, that the more unequal your society the more fully you just inherit your life chances from your parents. So a baby's born, whacked on the backside, and with its first breath, draws in its future income pr prospects, its future educational level, even its life expectancy, just set for life in one breath. And I think we can all see, even if we ar can argue about what we mean by fairness and, and, a, and a more equal society, we can all instinctively see that that's unfair, that's a route we don't want to travel down. Um, so I do, I feel very strongly about that and I feel that's the thing that we have to kind of, um, in order to avert the prospect of that being our future, we very much have to sort of look it in the eye and accept that that's the direction we're, we're travelling in now. I mean, the other thing I'd say, by the way, which is a more, more positive thing, and it's also a strange and weird thing, is that societies, pretty much every society that's um, gathering data is growing more unequal at the top. I mean, we, there's a funny thing in Britain at the moment because of the credit crunch that some of the indexes of inequality are actually going down. But at the top, people are doing better and kind of striding away from the rest. Um, but the funny thing is that as societies grow more unequal, the, the world is actually growing closer together. And there's this very, you know, uh, the, the, the UN's targets for the Millennium Development Goals, which are targets for 2015, um, you know, things like halving the number of people living in absolute poverty. Uh, we've achieved that. We're ahead of schedule. In, in 1980, 50% of the world's population was living on less than a, a dollar a day. And now it's just under 20%, on dollar twenty-five a day. That's material progress of a sort that's completely unprecedented in human history. It's more than the Industrial Revolution. And, and it's astonishing that, you know, we're not talking about a small country of a few million people. We're not talking about Denmark or Ireland doing better. We're talking about billions and billions of people having fundamentally different life chances, which is a, a, an astonishing thing. Um, uh, child infant mortality is another one. Um, you remember there used to be those ads where Bono would click, you know, all this, the celebs would click their fingers and, and look solemnly into the camera and say, every time I click my fingers, a child dies. You know, famously prompting someone in Ireland to shout at Bono, to stop fecking doing it then. <laughs> and, and, um, but, you know, but the thing about that is you could now click your fingers every, every six seconds for a child's life saved. It's, it's uh, 16,000 children a day, 6 million children's lives a year being saved compared to 20 years ago, which is an astonishing thing. And so what's, hap what's happening is that countries are growing closer together and societies are growing further apart. And it's a really, really you can't sort of put, it, put the slogan on a T-shirt and go march about it because it's, it's a complicated thing. It's very hard to get your, your head around. But it, it, and I, think it's, I suspect it's probably unprecedented in human history. So we're living through this moment of increasing equality and increasing inequality at the same time. I want to just touch on a couple of terms that I think are worth um, exploring just because they're fun. <laughs> so one of the ones talking about inequality and as indicators of how we're doing is this term, the hot waitress index, yeah. which I love. <laughs> I, mean, I hadn't actually come across it until I read the book. What, the hot, well, I was what, trying to get something that, that I was trying to get something that had a, fla a flavor of how traders and people talk. Yeah. Uh, and so I put the hot waitress index in, which is a grossly offensive and sexist term, which I highly recommend no one ever using. Uh, and it's the idea, it's one of these, there are lots and lots of these fanciful things about pr predicting the state of the economy by things like, I mean, you know, you look out the window and you count how many cranes there are, and that tells you if there's more cranes, the economy's doing well. <laughs> um, or, you know, it's harder to get a taxi. Again, duh. You know, they're all thumpingly obvious. And the hot waitress index, the, uh, the idea is that there are uh, higher paying jobs further up the economy for, you know, as it were, actresses and models in good times 
But when times are bad, the people who would be working as actresses and models and doing what uh, Lena Dunham in Girls calls pretty girl jobs instead of working as waitresses. So the idea is that it's a kind of slightly leading indicator of the way the economy is going. So if your barista's pretty hot... It's not so good for not the Not one at a time, but in aggregate. In aggregate, okay. If you see like <laughs> 10 in a row, that's, that's, it means sell, sell, sell. <laughs> and the other term that I think is just worth, it's one of my favourite terms, um, which took me a while to get my head round, is this, the term shadow banks. Oh, yeah. And because you're talking about new inequality and, and asymmetry, and I think a lot of this is about information asymmetry, and shadow banks, I think, epitomizes that asymmetry really well. What on earth is shadow banking? It's, um, you know, uh, credit card companies, uh, debt, uh, payday loans, uh, all kinds of insurance that involves bank swapping things backwards and forwards. And as I say, uh, the thing about all these institutions is that because they don't take customer deposits the way normal banks do, they're much more lightly regulated. The system is interlocking, at many points deliberately opaque, and almost impossible to understand in granular detail, even to the best brief financial insiders. And one of the weird things is no one actually knows how big it is. No one knew how big it was. It played a huge role in the credit crunch, and no one had been thinking about it before. And the, the current guess, the Bank of England's best guess, is that the shadow system is $67 trillion dollars which is the same size as the GDP of planet Earth. And it's not regulated it's, you know, in the same way, and it's largely invisible and deliberately opaque, and it's incredibly tightly linked with itself. So all the stuff we do about regulating banks, arguably, is just like you know, splashing around in the bath compared to the thing that could be the source of the next problem. Which leads me to my concluding point before we take some questions. Given that we've spent so much time trying to regulate the banks um, and try to get them to behave in an admirable way. Um, this shadow banking thing is, is now becoming a bit uncontrollable. It's like whack-a-mole. You, you regulate yeah. them here and then pops up over here and, there's, and it's bleeding into the technology space. So now you've got these technology companies and platforms and Googles and Apple Pays and, and all sorts of... How, how do you think... And they're not regulated. They don't have banking licenses. Yeah. One of the various ironies is that, you know, um, regulation to some extent protects the banks because it makes it harder for incumbents to start. I think most of us would, would want some form of disrup disruption to come, particularly to the, you know, our deeply unloved high street banks. I remember asking um, a friend in the, in the business what he thought of, you know, how well run our, house, our high street banks are. He had a drink which he put down and says, they are mere burdens on the earth. You know, and I think if something that made lending money and borrowing money and get short-circuited the banks would be uh, very welcome. The trouble is that there is no choice, it seems like, between over-regulation or the Wild West. And I think it's one of the things that when Mark Carney was talking about the other day, um, he chooses his words very carefully, I mean, he has to, it's the nature of it, um, that, you know, we fixed most of the things that caused the last crisis, but it doesn't mean we fix the causes of the next one. You know, I, I'm afraid, I think that's a quote that we may well be recycling in a couple of years' time to take as, you know, a giant warning about what's coming down the pipe. I think Wild West is such a great analogy. It, such, I mean, it, it really is. And um, in terms of the technology space now, I, 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 I personally am very worried because of this um, perception that it's a free-for-all and it doesn't matter what the regulations are. And, and you see that across the set. It's not just banking. It's Uber, it's Airbnb and all these... Uh, <clears throat> it's disrupting everything. But um, uh, I do wonder also with the bankers... I, what I find, from my point of view, very interesting is that they're being now thrown a whole new tribal language language at their faces by the technology guys. So suddenly their fancy terms about CD, uh, CDOs and subprime, forget about it. You, you need to know about cryptocurrency and uh, TCP, whatever. I don't, I don't know the, uh, the internet language, but um, do you know what I mean? I do know, yeah. There is a, there's a very funny series, Silicon Valley, written by Mike Judge of Beavis and Butthead. And there's a hilarious thing at the end of that, which actually isn't scripted. It's just the actual footage of this big conference in San Francisco. And, and he just cuts to, between every time people saying, we're social, local. 
and mobile. And then the next people, <laughs> we're solo mo. And then the people after, we're mo lo so, but in that order. You know, and it's just one after the other. Yeah, there is a whole, you know, the new jargons. I mean, it's one of the things about jargon is that there are new ones coming along absolutely all the time. Destined to repeat. Oh, it's cyclical. Keep, we just keep going and, and going and And disrupt, going. by the way, is one of the ones I regret, you know, I, I could have, I should, I could, should and will in future do a thing on disrupt because that's, you know, if, if I could just, if there's just like one term I could ban at the moment, it would be, in the world of arts and books and writing and all that, it would be curate. <laughs> and in this area, it would be disrupt. Everything's being disrupted. Um, so on that note, I thought I'd uh, open the door, uh, open the floor to questions. I'm just wondering what kind of research you did in terms of the kind of finance professionals you talked to and what your impression was of them since the crash, whether there's a sense of uh, a changed understanding of their own responsibility, maybe there's a, a growth or a lack of growth in moral awareness. You just There's so many things in the media now where bankers and finance professionals are demonised. And I'm just wondering, is it less justified than it used to be? Are they more responsible than they used to be? Are they more morally conscious than they used to be? Or not? Well, there was always a massive range. I mean, the thing is that we talk about bankers as if they're one thing, but in fact, there's lots of different tribes inside banking, and and the institutions behave differently. And you know, uh, the the mass nerds, the quants, are very different from the traders, who are very different from the analysts, who are very different from the um, merger and takeover people, who have nothing at all to do with the people you actually meet across the front of the counter. I mean, it's it's a whole. Um, as someone who I quote says, there's this very striking description of banks, is they're, they're more like loose associations of money-making franchises. That's what the big investment banks are really like. And they have very little sense of what each other does and very, not much interest in it, frankly. Um, and so there's lots of different tribes. And then people in things like you know, private equity um, and um, you know, buyouts and things like that, quite a lot of them hated the banks all along. You know, and, and one of the things when I wrote a book about the credit crunch, I was most surprised by I thought that as it were lefties would like it, people in the world of finance would hate it. Um, but actually, lots of people in the world of money and business and finance are furious about what's been happening inside banking. I mean, they sound like the Occupy movement, some people in private equity, who have no choice but to deal with the banks, and they're incandescent. So that, that's been, you know, I'm reluctant to lump them into one thing. The one thing that is really, really striking, just among the people I know, is that um, some of the people who used to talk now won't. Basically, all the bankers now won't. And it's a, a recurrent thing. They won't talk. I mean, you talk about them being criticised in public, as indeed they have been. But they won't defend themselves. And a thing that repeatedly happens is that I get called up, you know, when they, whenever there's a new scandal or crisis, which is about every 20 minutes, um, someone says, will you come on the programme and, you know, we'll have, we'll do Punch and Judy, we'll have you and a banker so putting the other side of it. To which I always say, well, you won't, get the, you won't get the person on the other side of it. You know, they just won't do it. And, and indeed, they never, ever, ever do. You know, if you talk to um, news organisations, that it's just impossible to get people inside um, that, those parts of finance, inside the big banks, on the record. They just won't do what they call accountability in interviews at all. And I think, I think they're making a big mistake by that. Because I think, firstly, you have to, you know, partly for a subtle reason, which is what it makes them look like. What it makes them look like is like people who, who are going to get all the things they want in private. They don't need to make the arguments in public because they can just do it backstage. And that's a very unfortunate impression to give when and if they need some more help in the undistant future. In journalism, sometimes we know there's a story, not because of who's there, but because who's because who's missing. And I see that happening on, on LinkedIn, for example. Nowadays, you know, if someone doesn't have a LinkedIn profile, there's probably some reason for it, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, even quite good friends who work in big banks will now not talk, even privately, even off the record, even after the fourth glass of chili and chardonnay. They say, you know, just don't ask me about, you know, whatever, that, whatever the topic of the week is. And it's actually quite shocking. As a, my friend Michael Lewis says, you know, it, it, if they think they have nothing to hide, nothing to hide, that's certainly not how they behave. Right, exactly. So we just assume. But there's a new, new jargon word for it all as well. It's compliance, right? Compliance, yeah. Compliance. Uh, please go. Could I, ask, could, I, could I ask you a question about politics? We've got an election coming up next year, in case we've all forgotten. This seems a very big, important subject nationally, yet I, don't, I, I would say that there's been very little political debate about this 
and uh, not much from either, for any of the main parties, about what seems to be a huge and ongoing and changing question. I wonder if you'd like to say why you think that is. I think because they don't know what to say. I couldn't agree more, by the way. And one of my motives for writing this book, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't have written it if someone else already had. Um, and, and I really feel strongly about the need to kind of get people engaged with the subjects. It's really, really important. It's actually fundamental to the way democracy works. Democracy implies an informed electorate. Otherwise, you might as well go in and just make random marks on the paper, depending on how you feel that day. And I think that there's the, the sense of urgency pressing on people as they think about this stuff, and then their wish to have it debated and analysed and be told the truth, um, isn't at all matched by what the political class is doing. There's a, there's a catastrophic failure, I think, of um, a failure of engagement, a failure of will, and, and it leads to a sense of... Um, Diane Coyle was talking about this in Kilkenny, where we both were the other week, a sense of powerlessness. You know, people feel... They want to pull a lever, but, but they don't feel there is one to pull in terms of conventional politics. That was one of the things that was very energising and very striking about the Scottish referendum, that, that it gave people, whether you think rightly or wrongly, about the specific choices, but that it was electrifying in the sense that people felt they could actually make a consequential political choice. They personally, every single one, had agency and a lever to pull that could cause real change. And it was very striking for the extent to which people just don't feel that. And I, and I think, you know, I think the culprit is really that, 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 there's a, that the, the political parties haven't caught up with where people are in terms of their feeling about the state of things. And they, and they don't really know what to say because I think the sort of private thing is they all secretly think, well, sort of more of the same, more or less indefinitely. Yeah, so what, what you seem to be saying is that if all things financial did what they said on the tin, we'd be a lot better off. Um, so I just wanted to give you an example of a really simple product which couldn't possibly have gone wrong in that argument um, called payment protection insurance, which was, uh, did exactly what it said on the tin, or in theory it did. Um, and um, as we all know, you know, there's a huge mis-selling scandal that's, I think, uh, banks have so forth paid back about six billion. So that suggests to me that there is something more than language going on, and it's to do with the relationship with banks and customers. But I wonder what you thought was the kind of what went wrong in, in terms of that and how that became such a scandal, even though it's a simple product. Well, it, 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 because it very straightforwardly didn't say what it did. You know, if, if payment protection insurance protected your payments and insured them, it would have been all right. Uh, but it's, 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 quite a, it's quite striking. You know, I sometimes think the number of things in this area that you can just categorize just by saying the opposite. We're all in this together. No, we're not. You know, um, and payment protection insurance will protect your payments. No, they won't. You know, not for, uh, under a whole set of range of conditions, like you know, people like me, who have repeatedly tried to sell it to me, and I can repeatedly kept telling them to piss off, because I knew perfectly well, because I'm self-employed, because I'd read the small print. But, but it wasn't at all transparent that it just very simply didn't, in lots and lots and lots of cases, it didn't do the thing it said. I mean, it happens a lot in insurance. If you have a teenager and try and insure their mobile phone, and you look, read the small print, and um, it basically says it, it, you know, it's not insuring it in conditions where it's not loss. So you insure it against loss, but it turns out the small print for loss means not if it's mislaid in a public place. It has to be actually physically taken from you, accompanied by the threat of force. So the thing that is insuring its loss doesn't insure its loss. And I think that's a pro you can say that's a problem of language, or you can say it's a problem of people being deliberately misleading. But what, in effect, it comes down to is this thing of objects not doing, instruments and objects just not doing the thing that you in good faith would assume they do do. Um, there's an old saying that you, um, you can't pull down the master's house using the master's tools. Mm. And I wonder what kind of language do you think is necessary or what kind of tools are necessary to use to actually challenge the kind of dominant false narrative that you've been describing for us? Well, I think that the toolkit of economics as it currently exists isn't, um, isn't a, a bad place to start. I mean, that's why I've started with it here. I think that the, um, the kind of... And in fact, I think some of the reasons that Britain is such a sort of... in a kind of quite a febrile condition at the moment is just to do with people not having a clearer grasp of where we actually are. You know, I think the languages and the... And the toolkit of economics can really help with that because 
you would, you know, if you're having the longest sustained fall in real wages adjusted for inflation since records began, which we are, and records began in 1855, i.e. it's quite a long time ago, you are going to get people feeling really angry and disconnected and flailing around and looking for someone to blame and looking for probably human nature being what it is, cheap, quick fixes for it. And I think that's, you know, if more people were aware of this thing, the, I mean, it's, it's longer, it's a longer fall in real income than the Great Depression. So of course people are going to be freaking out and angry and confused and, and seeking, someone, seeking someone to blame. It's a situation like, it's a bit like, um, and in that situation like that, things can be like lightning rods. You know, the lightning can flash down and hit targets that have, you know, immigration or Europe label written on them. Whereas in fact, what people are really steamed up about is the fact that, you know, they thought they were going to have a better life. That's the implicit social contract. And they're not. So I think that, you know, we may be moving towards a world in which, you know, people are using other tools and other vocabularies. But this is the one we've got right here and now. And it's actually, as toolkits and vocabularies go, it's not a bad one, I think, for understanding where we are. Yes, thanks for that talk, John. I mean, it's very good that, um, to have a debunking exercise on uh, the language of economics. Um, and I would agree with you that not many people understand that language in terms of your, your own experience that you're describing. But I want to make a distinction, I guess, between understanding the language of economics and understanding how the world works. It does seem to me that an awful lot of people who are not economists know perfectly well how the world does work, and especially in a fundamental way, how money works, who gets it and who doesn't get it, uh, and, how, and in whose interests the world is organized. And what strikes me, and again it picks up the, uh, the earlier question really, is the failure of um, the political classes who are now completely uh, disengaged really from the mass of the population to, help, to be able to speak to the fundamental knowledge that people have of how the world works and how it could work. Yeah. And so the demystification of uh, the, current, not the current language of economics also needs to go alongside the building up of an alternative knowledge which actually addresses how the world really does work. No, I agree with that, but I think that, the tool, that, that you know, we are tool-using animals, and I think that the toolkit is a very useful one. I think one of the reasons that, that, that Thomas Piketty's book, Struck, Capital in the 21st Century, struck such an astonishing chord uh, all around the English-speaking world, uh, that interestingly not in France, but it wasn't the bestseller, uh, was that um, you know, Piketty in, put hard numerical data on a thing that we could all feel was true. We, we all sort of knew this thing about the people at the top getting further and further away. But actually having a really substantial body of empirical evidence that you, know, you, you, you can't evade it, there the data are, it's very clear what they say. I think that does have an impact on the debate. You know, it makes it less into a thing about you know, oh, moan, lefties moaning because we, you know, we would say that, and more into a thing that just, just stands out really clear in the data. You know, that the, the um, the one percent, or arguably more, of a problem than 0.1, just are having a bigger slice of the cake than ever historically before. And I think that the the kind of the the economics is a useful toolkit and language for, as a starting point, really, for those other kinds of analysis and asking the question, saying, of, "Okay, okay, what next?" Uh, I think we've got time for maybe one or maybe two very quick questions. Maybe if we take two in the row, then we can you can address them both at the same time. John, I've, I've just been puzzling for a few minutes over something you said earlier um, about when the bankers might need help. Because yeah. I don't understand that. Because, I mean, the story that I hear, um, maybe a bit simplistically, is that um, there's nothing we can do about the bankers. Uh, they'll get away with it. Because if we try and do anything, they'll bring the whole, the whole house of cards down on top of us all. So I'm a bit mystified as to how they could possibly need help. And if we could take the second question. Yeah, you started this discussion uh, talking about how uh, breaking into finance is difficult with the jargon and, and it's difficult for people to understand. But the mechanisms of, uh, of how finance work, uh, it's important that people do understand it. I was wondering if you have any insights on the, the range of tools or the range of ways that um, we can educate people on the mechanics of how finance actually works. Well, I'll take the second one first. I have a bibliography in the book, and actually there are a lot of good tools. Um, uh, once you get through this problem of you know, basic 
literacy. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm a writer, so I would say this, but I do think the vocabulary is the place to start because if you don't follow the vocabulary, you, you know, there's a very basic and literal way in which you literally don't know what people are talking about. But once you get over that, there's lots of good commentary. Um, it's one of the areas where the internet is very good, actually, economics. There's lots of both raw data and very good, you know, wide range of views from all sorts of different political perspectives. And, you know, as I said once or twice before, that, you know, one of my ambitions for the book is just that people can read the FT. You know, if you can read the FT, you don't need to read my book. Cause, and the, the level of debate in it is actually, I think, really interesting, especially as a place, a place to start. I mean, the tools are there. People just need to pick them up. On the thing about the banks needing help, it's just that, you know, that they're in quite a fragile condition, that they're, um, they're trying to address this in what they call the leverage ratio, which is basically the amount the multiple they have of debt to how much they actually own. Um, but some of these big banks are in astonishingly fragile institutions. I mean, the Deutsche Bank is, which is trying to fix it now. They've uh, that's a campaign to address it. But uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they're the biggest bank in the world. They're, they're much bigger than the UK, entire UK economy. And they're, they had a margin of 2%, which means that 2% of their investments go wrong. The biggest bank in the world is broke. And, and that, that's what I mean by, by needing help. And we'd, Mark Carney was, was talking about a package of programs to try and address it and have more of a margin of error. But, you know, they're still inherently in quite a fragile condition. And I think the thing that will happen, you know, they got their bailout which they needed and then we didn't have any of the reforms we should have had to make it sort of safer and more, more useful from our point of view and to separate the casino-like activities from the stuff that, from which, which actually helps us, which we need. And uh, all that, those things w are going to come, I suspect, uh, after the crisis that lots and lots of in insiders think is, um, is coming in the not-too-distant future. And you know, it'll be an example, there's an old saying that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And in, and in effect, the 2008-9, we, we all across the developed world um, w wasted the crisis for an opportunity to properly reform the way finance works. Thank you very much. I think we've run out of time. Unfortunately, we could talk about it forever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.